In 1961, the involvement of the U.S. Air Force in the Vietnam War was only in support of the anti-communist republic. It flew in response to emergency requests and officially was not authorized to carry out combat missions unless there was at least one South Vietnamese crew member. However, between August 2 and 4, 1964, three patrol boats from the Navy of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, a communist regime, attacked two U.S. Navy destroyers in the Gulf of Tonkin. This incident provided the United States with the necessary excuse to fully engage in the conflict. From there, an escalation of U.S. retaliations followed by North Vietnamese attacks unfolded over the next six months. President Lyndon Johnson concluded that these missions were not sufficient because, in his words, it had become clear, unequivocally, that Hanoi was preparing to kill. So, what decision did he make? In the next few minutes, we invite you to learn about the most intense air bombing campaign waged during the Cold War, Operation Rolling Thunder, and why this marked a resounding tactical and strategic failure for the United States Air Force. Join us in this new installment of military aviation. After the flaming dart operation, in retaliation for the North Vietnamese attack on Camp Holloway, the Johnson administration requested on February 13, 1965, a program of action against North Vietnam. This marked the beginning of Operation Rolling Thunder. The main objective of this operation was to destroy the enemy's industrial base, transport lines, and communications to halt the flow of personnel and support material from Hanoi to Saigon. However, a controversial decision that may seem incredible, the White House prohibited U.S. air operations within a 15-kilometer radius around Hanoi. Furthermore, restrictions were imposed on the selection of specific targets within a larger 48-kilometer radius. Only Johnson, with advice from administration officials like Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, had the authority to order air operations within that zone. These restrictions would prove to be very problematic. Rolling Thunder began on March 2, 1965, with only one mission per week, targeting the southern part of North Vietnam. During the first two years, aviators were also not allowed to attack the bases from which enemy MiG fighters flew. Rules of engagement continued to change. A target on the approved list one week could be off-limits the next. From start to finish, Rolling Thunder was hindered by a policy of gradual escalation, which undermined the impact of airstrikes and gave North Vietnam time to recover and adapt. How could a successful bombing campaign be pretended while imposing limitations on range and objectives simultaneously? The reality was much more complex, the Johnson administration feared that a more aggressive bombing campaign would increase civilian casualties and could escalate the war by provoking the Soviets and the Chinese. The true strength of the enemy around Hanoi and Haiphong was not touched or even threatened. For instance, bombers were prohibited from entering the entire seaport of Haiphong because Soviet ships unloaded supplies and provisions there. In reality, there was a hidden objective, to dissuade authorities based in Hanoi, leading them to simply withdraw their support for the Viet Cong. Apparently, the White House expected this to yield quick results and was disappointed when it didn't. The United States did not want to get bogged down in a ground war in Asia. However, this was exactly what ended up happening. Faced with the strange and controversial U.S. strategy, the People's Air Force of North Vietnam responded pragmatically and intelligently. Knowing that U.S. rules of engagement prevented them from attacking certain types of targets, the North Vietnamese strategically placed their surface-to-air missile launchers just within these restricted zones. They covered a sufficient range to protect targets related to the transportation and supply system which were located 48 kilometers from Hanoi. Interestingly, at the beginning of the campaign, North Vietnam's air defense system was not formidable and could have been easily destroyed. In fact, the first anti-aircraft site was detected on April 5, 1965, but U.S. pilots were not allowed to attack it. During Operation Rolling Thunder, the North Vietnamese fired nearly 5,000 surface-to-air missiles, bringing down 101 U.S. aircraft. However, it wasn't the anti-aircraft missiles that posed a threat to U.S. units, about 68% of the losses were due to artillery fire. 
By 1968, North Vietnam had 1,158 operational batteries with a total of 5,795 deployed weapons. The iconic aircraft of the U.S. Air Force during Operation Rolling Thunder was the now legendary F-4 Phantom II, but especially the F-105 Thunderchief, known to all as the Thud. It conducted 75% of the attacks but suffered more losses in North Vietnam than any other aircraft type. By the end of the operation, more than half of the F-105s in the Air Force had disappeared. And while it is true that most of the losses of U.S. aircraft were due to the inefficiency of dealing with anti-aircraft fire, the stain on the pride of the U.S. Air Force in rolling thunder came from air-to-air -air combat. How was it possible for the People's Air Force of North Vietnam, inexperienced in air combat, to be responsible for causing such dishonor? Like their jungle fighters, they patiently learned from mistakes and applied unconventional tactics. Until 1966, they focused on building an extensive network of ground radars, while their pilots gained experience with their MiG-17s and MiG-21s. Acting cautiously, Hanoi refused to commit their men to aerial combat unless the odds were in their favor. Thanks to this precautionary measure, only 28 North Vietnamese planes were lost in combat during this period. However, in early 1967, North Vietnamese pilots became overconfident and engaged American aviators head-on. They were gravely mistaken. On January 2, 1967, the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing commanded by Colonel Robin Olds, equipped with F-4 Phantoms, set up an ambush. Imitating the routes, call signs, and even radar interference capsules that F-105D Thunderchief used routinely for their bombings, they managed to lure and surprise MiG-21 interceptors, who did not expect the Sidewinder missiles launched by the Phantoms. In just 12 minutes, seven MiG-21s were shot down over the Red River Valley in North Vietnam. Between January and July, U.S. Air Force fighters flying air-to-air -air missions shot down 29 MiGs and lost only two of their own, a death ratio of 14.5 to 1. The key to this success was the implementation of a force economy measure, using phantoms that could be deployed for both bomb attacks and air combat patrols. These could ditch their air-to-ground weaponry and become air-to-air -air fighters if necessary. While this approach made sense at the time, it turned out to be a big mistake. Having lost half of their combat aircraft in just a few weeks between March and June 1967, the People's Air Force of North Vietnam began to lick its wounds. It entered a period of self-examination, training, and reconstitution before adopting a different tactic that created headaches for the U.S. Air Force until the end of the war. The MiG-21s applied a tactic of air guerrilla warfare, the agile Soviet-made aircraft stalked U.S. formations from the rear, fired their AA-2A Atoll missiles, and retreated. They either dove through the formation of U.S. planes, only to turn around and drag the enemy into individual battles. F-4 Phantom II pilots had to adapt to constantly changing rules of engagement. The most problematic for those escorting bombing runs was having to visually identify enemy aircraft targets instead of relying on their plane's radar, designed to give them an advantage only at long range. On the other hand, specific failures in Phantom's air-to-air -air missiles, combined with a lack of proper dogfight training for U.S. Air Force pilots, contributed to, in the last months of Operation Rolling Thunder, by the end of 1968, the enemy shooting down 22 U.S. planes at a cost of 20 MiGs. In all cases, the victories of the MiGs began from behind an unsuspecting target. This was a depressing turn of events, as the overall death ratio of the U.S. Air Force fell from 4.1 to 1 to 2.3 to 1. In January 1968, North Vietnam launched its Tet Offensive, attacking bases and cities throughout the South. It was not a military success, but it shocked the American public, and support for the war plummeted. The U.S. Air Force, unable to solve the problem of surprise attacks, considered that the success of future operations would be at risk. The Johnson administration then announced a partial cessation of bombings, eventually bringing an end to Rolling Thunder on November 2, 1968. It had lasted three years and eight months, making it the longest air campaign in U.S. history up to that point. During this period, more bombs were dropped on Vietnam than on the entire continent of Europe during World War II. 
The Air Force and other services had conducted 304,000 fighter sorties, with a total cost of $900 million for the entire campaign, losing 922 aircraft in the process. It caused only about $300 million in damages. The strategy ended without achieving any tactically significant results. It did not persuade the North Vietnamese to abandon the war or halt the infiltration of troops and equipment from Hanoi into South Vietnam. Operation Rolling Thunder demonstrated that, due to its intermittent nature, political precautions regarding the Soviets, and the inability of the U.S. military to adapt to unconventional opponents, it was not designed for success. And ultimately, it did not succeed. As we reach the end of the video, we are interested in hearing your opinion, do you think the decisions of the United States were justified? If they had attacked with more determination, would they have had greater success or provoked a larger scale conflict? Leave your response in the comments below. That concludes today's video, we look forward to seeing you in the upcoming installments of Military Aviation.